right. Well, now that we've got all that settled, uh, should we go to Pittsburgh, Brian, for payback? Payback is hell, daddy. What do you think of Pittsburgh? I li- well, you know, you know who still has the record. For Bruno San Martin. The- oh, go ahead. No. For main eventing the most people ever to see a wrestling match in Pittsburgh, at least indoors. I know they did some stadium stuff in the early 60s. Big Bubba Rogers with Jim Cornette against Dusty Rhodes in the finals of the Bunkhouse Stampede 1987. 16,600 people at the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. They were standing. That was the biggest wrestling from the building, from their own chicken lips, the most people ever to see a wrestling match in Pittsburgh, the home of Bruno Sammartino. I'm quite proud of that one. Why do you think it resonated so well there? Was it the gimmick of the bunkhouse stampede? Was it how hot everything was? Why do you think Pittsburgh had that number? It was not only... It, it, the the finals had been promoted because it was Dusty's deal, right? So it had been beaten to death on TBS and the syndicated TV. But plus, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll I'll be happy to be corrected, that was the first time since Crockett had got real hot that we'd been in Pittsburgh. And I think the first time at the Civic Arena, if I remember correctly, because they had done, remember, they did a Three Rivers Stadium show with uh, Magnum and TA, uh, Magnum and TA, Magnum and Flair in what, 85? And they had a like a 50 minute match, even in the rain. And they had. There had been a couple of shows in that market, but that was the first big one with everybody on the card after we got real hot, if I remember correctly. You want to hear what the card was? Well, go ahead. It's better than what we're about to talk about. February 27th, 1987, Pittsburgh Civic Arena, 17,000 plus fans. Well, you know the exact number. I like like that they gave us that, but that would have been impossible in that arena. But 16,600 was... Uh, and and one hundred and sixty six thousand dollars at the gate. The average ticket I figured at ten dollars. Hector Guerrero versus Shaska Watley ended without a winner. Vladimir Pietrov defeated Jim Lancaster. Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch defeated Wahoo McDaniel and Dusty uh, Dusty and Dutch Mantel. <laughs> Lex Luger defeated Ricky Lee Jones. That was Ricky Gibson, Robert Gibson's older brother. The Fabulous Ricky Gibbs. NWA TV champion Tully Blanchard defeated Tim Horner. NWA World Tag Team champions Rick Rude and Manny Fernandez defeated the Rock and Roll Express. The U.S. champion Nikita Koloff defeated Ric Flair, the NWA World Champion, by disqualification. And the Bunkhouse Stampede Final Steel Cage Match. Dusty Rhodes defeated Big Bubba. No trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Not a stacked lineup, though. I mean, a lot of stars on that show. Yeah, but it it wasn't the great. The Midnight were not on the on the show, and that was my first day back after we had burned Ronnie Garvin in in Charlotte on Valentine's Day. Um, and Ronnie was in uh, still allegedly in the hospital and partially blinded, and the angle was the Midnight's against Ronnie and now Jimmy and Jimmy had just turned babyface that night. It had just shown on TV the previous week. So we, they couldn't have that match there. And I flew back in from my suspension, AKA my first wedding and my honeymoon in Hawaii to do the Pittsburgh show with Bubba. This is early 87. So he probably in February, I don't even think he was a horseman yet. Luger versus Ricky Gibson, Ricky Lee Jones. Is that just to give Luger an opponent who could do a lot to make him look really good? Yeah, well, yes and no, in that it was to give an opponent, give him an opponent to make him look good and to get a good win. And unfortunately, by that point, Ricky Gibson's injuries and knees back had prevented him from doing what he did 10 years previously, but he still knew what he was doing psychologically and could get, you know, the heel over like that. But it wasn't like he was going out there taking those fucking sky high, insane backdrops and everything at that point in time. Unfortunate. What'd you think of the flair Nikita Koloff matches when Nikita turned baby face? They were, they were good because flair could work. He had, Think how many matches he'd had with uh, Kerry Von Erich, with um, the Road Warriors. He could work the pattern with Luger. Uh, you know, later on, he he could work the pattern. 
you know, of the big guy that all he had to do was bump off of and then heel down and get heat and then make the big comeback with press slam and he could keep it exciting. And Nikita worked his gimmick very well. He knew that he couldn't do a lot of shit, so he relied on what he did do. And it, to our eyes at that point in time, he was not a polished worker. But if you got a guy that looked like that of that size and that intensity and put him out today just to do what he could do then, he'd be one of the biggest stars in the business. Well, he was one of the biggest stars in the business then, but he'd be even bigger now because it's not common. See, I told you we'd have some fun talking about wrestling today somehow. As long as we didn't talk about payback, which I'm wondering, is that, Brian, the the emotion they wanted to instill in the heads of the fans? They They got the pay-per-view, they want to be paid back? reimbursed oh, even it wasn't that bad there was some oh, good come stuff on. I, I, no i'm i'm joshing um but they opened up with the cage match between becky lynch and trish stratus and i wrote this is the state of wrestling the opening match is a girl's cage match and again i'm not going to give you a fucking blow by blow or play by play on this match but they wonder why nobody's scared of dangerous match stipulations anymore because the girls can survive inside the steel cage. So what about a guy like Solo? Do we have to put him in a steel cage of barbed wire and there's some kind of goddamn curare poisoning on all the points? If, if you get st stuck, you'll instantly fucking croak or whatever. How... Eh, do you see what I'm saying here? I don't have a big problem with it in the sense that it's not like it's a Becky Lynch versus a woman the size of Solo. It's two women that are somewhat the same size beating well, the crap out of each other. So it's not like something that seems unrealistic, you know, past the point of, you know, the usual. But I'm talking about it's a cage. I've Not even... Well, this should have been their even, SummerSlam match, probably. Well, but let's not even go by gender. What if you fucking, when you envision people fighting in a cage, okay, the UFC calls the octagon the cage now. In the wrestling of days gone by, uh, the cage match was cyclone fence or, you know, fucking chicken wire or whatever. In movies, if people are fighting in a cage, you think, oh, the roaring crowd and here's the blood and the sweat flying and these people are in this dirty cage and they're throttling each other or whatever. If it's two 125-pound women bashing each other against this steel in an immaculate, spotless ring with well-lit, it just, I don't, fuck, I don't, you can't have blood, you shouldn't have blood because it's the girls, but how dangerous is this? Taking gender out of it, as I was going to say a second ago, what if it was a guy that looked like Bix? Fighting a guy that looks like Wally Cox in a fucking cage. <laughs> right? I didn't know you were going to go there. <laughs> and, and they come out of it without a scratch on them. Oh. What the fuck did then? When, 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 when fucking Sylvester Stallone and fucking goddamn Chuck Norris or whoever the fuck goes to goddamn cage, what's, then why should they sweat it? It, 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 Bix well, and Wally were fine. Well, again, that, that Bix and Wally may be the uh, super heavyweight division. I don't know, but we're talking about these two women. If we're going with the idea that, and I know we're not, and this isn't reality, but if there were weight divisions, this would be like a steel cage in the 125 pound <laughs> woman's division. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, they kept it moving. Hey, do you have what? any? Do you have any at all? Is there anything positive you see about the WWF style cages of the eighties and nineties, the blue cages? No, no, I hated those fucking things. The ring crew hated them. The boys, everybody hated them. The only thing is, so Hogan and Bundy and guys that size could fucking climb them. Otherwise, big they boss man suck. Hogan superplexed boss the big man. boss man at the top of it. Yes. But the the problem with those things were they weighed a ton. They were steel bars close to an inch thick. 
And they weighed a ton. The ring crew hated carrying them around. The fucking boys hated running into them because they would split you wide open if you did it wrong. They had no give whatsoever. And it was just all visual for the big giants to, to climb. But when guys started doing shit and or trying to have Southern style cage matches where the heel would get flung face first into the cage, you couldn't fucking do it. But I thought and, this, but again, with the caveat that I knew watching it too, like, oh my God, Jim's going to shit on not only that they started with a woman's match, but that it was a woman's cage match. I don't mind him starting with the women's match and get it out of the way. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking there, but no, it just, again, here's another thing. Beca and I'm going to compliment them finally here. They kept it moving. They Both girls can work. They did a nice bunch of stuff. It, you know, a good match in itself. The concept uh, of it is what I'm questioning here. But then, also because it's WWE cage match, Becky hits her finish, and Zoe comes into the cage and makes a save. <laughs> because, of course... You can have interference and run-ins in a cage match due to the goofy rules that Vince has always loved for these cage matches, where the door is open, all, and the referee just standing there holding it, but it's not locked. People come and go. My favorite, is when pe my favorite is when people dramatically close it behind themselves, but you know it's not locked. They didn't close it and it didn't shut. It could open right back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's like you're having an argument with somebody, you slam the fucking door in their face, right? It's like, well, I can't lock it because it's a fucking closet door or whatever. But anyway, so that happens, but then Becky beats up Zoe and then hits her finish on Trish, Trish off the top rope and one, two, three, it had to be 20 minutes. It was it more than 20 minutes. That's the only thing. Again, it was oh, long. It was so. very long. And then Zoe got mad at, at um, Trish and laid her out. So apparently that was Trish's adieu. And Zoe has got the heat passed to her, but so she got laid out by Becky and then Trish or uh, Zoe. I, I, thought, I thought it was really good. I really liked this match. I, I got into it more than I thought I would. And I really, really liked it. I thought it was really, really good. And again, I said they worked hard and they can work. And Trish is amazing to be. How old is she? I think she was like 46, maybe last time we checked. Whatever. You know, she was a fitness personality. So I assume she's always stayed in good shape. And she had a yoga eat, studio she opened up. It does yoga. I'm sure she eats turnips and parsnips for dinner and things like that. But. A very good match. I just, the women's cage and the interference and the finish and the blah, blah, blah. It's just, seems like a pattern where I complain about the AEW women's division and then like that week WWE does an event and the women's match, the main women's match wins me over. It's multiple pay-per-views in a row now where, what, Bianca and Io, Zelina had a big match that was really good. Yeah. Rhea Ripley stuff. It's like WWE's women's matches that most of them that make it onto the main show that aren't comedy related are excellent matches. <laughs> it's just everywhere else is the problem. Well, we ain't, we ain't made it to the one that kind of won me at this point, but. Oh. Um, so then here comes John Cena. He is the host of Payback and he makes his entrance. Yes. Can I say it? Um, I'm already sick of John Cena being well. <laughs> Damn it, he just got here. I know, and he's such a nice guy, but I'm sick of him already. That's that's like it's like the guy just got over to your house. He just sat down on the couch. You haven't even cracked the the top on the can and handed it to him, and you're already like, this motherfucker, is he ever gonna leave? <laughs> so he You haven't he cuts... disagreed you haven't disagreed with me though. <laughs> well no, I'm not tired of him yet. Well, here's the thing: at least we know something's gonna happen most of the time if um you know, if he's around, but I, I I wasn't sick of him yet from SmackDown, but give me a chance. <laughs> he cuts the promo where his job is to make tonight special, so he's going to be the guest referee for L.A. Knight and The Miz. And then The Miz makes his entrance and cuts the promo and tells Cena that he sucks as the host. And then they do... 
five minutes of cute scripted talk that is WWE style entertainment where John then said, well, well, give me some advice then, Miz. What should I do? And the Miz knocks him kind of backhanded. And, you know, he, but he tells, he's, he's got to be more involved. Don't dress like a Teletubby. Take charge. Make quick decisions. And so then Cena turns around and, and says, okay. And he gets his referee shirt and says, I will referee. And then they do the no, yeah, no, yeah thing. Rabbit season, duck season. So this was rotten, is what this was. And I would love to see somebody on a WWE program have a confrontation with some legitimate goddamn anger and hatred. And I'm not even talking about just Miz bowing up and, and using his acting skills to yell and pop his eyes out. Or... You know, everybody, I'm talking about le uh, some legitimate reason, some legitimate verbiage that you can tell that s two guys are about ready to snatch each other by the goozle pipe. That's what I'd like to see, but this wasn't it. But why couldn't John have said it's my job to make tonight special and something else and let Miz come instead of announcing he was going to be the referee to begin with and then confirming it later on. Why didn't he make the snap decision on a sperm of the moment that he'd be the referee to confound the Miz even more appropriately? I don't, I don't know. We've established that WWE wrestlers could just make their own stipulations on the spot. So why not? Well, now, well, now in this case, he's the host. So I think that gives him the, the authorization to do that anyway. So we can't, we, that, there's a loophole there. I hated this. I thought it went too long. It's the kind of WWE segment I don't like. And The Miz to me wasn't bad at delivering his stuff and being The Miz. Cena gets too corny for me. I started to use corny. Yeah, he, but, uh, hey, hey, yeah, there. What the, hold on here. You there, know what Cowboy. I mean, though. He gets well, too, too corny. Cheesy. To put it. Cheesy. Too, too cheesy. Too, too silly. But then here came L.A. Knight, and they had L.A. Knight in the Miz with John Cena as referee, and the second match on the pay-per-view, the bell rang 50 minutes into the show. 5-0. Because now they're turning the, the premium live events into Raw without commercials. And it just... Yeah, they, they still have commercials, actually. Well, they still have commercials, just not... You don't, they don't have to take a break. They just put their own in the show that you're watching. But yes, you know, that's... Anyway, the fans are doing the thing where they chant, yeah, when L.A. Knight punches, or, you know, when he does the, the head bonk on the, the desk, which he did here. But, and it was a back and forth. <sighs> Miz has been doing two-minute jobs for everybody. This was competitive, but if you didn't, if you overlook how Miz has been used for the last year or whatever the fuck, where everybody's beating him, including the, you know, grade school kid in the front row, this was good in that it was back and forth and gave L.A. Knight a lot of chances to have a flurry because the people get behind him. And then, you know, finally... um, after the back and forth, boom, 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 they went into a few false finishes. And finally, again, L.A. Knight hit the L.A. elbow and hit his finish. Boom, one, two, three. It was 15 minutes bell to bell. It got maybe a little bit long right before they really kicked it in. But that's what they should have done. Again, L.A. Knight wins one, two, three with his finish, and it wasn't. You know, he didn't have to walk through hell with gasoline britches on to do it. And then L.A. Knight and Cena shake hands, and Cena raises his hand, so there's the rub there, and that's what they were trying to accomplish by having John be the referee because he's not really great at it. What do you think? In terms of the overall thing, it's amazing how over L.A. Knight has gotten himself when he when his music hit. The fans knew he was coming out, and they reacted like it was a surprise. Big, big pop. Massively over. I thought the match went too long. It was too slow at times. 
It, it it started dragging a bit there toward the what what would you say the seventy five percentile mark? It was it took too long to get where it was going, and you know, and I and I liked it, and it was too long. I just missed the era of like, and I never thought I would say this, just good seven minute matches, <laughs> just in and out. You know, I loved WrestleMania three as a kid. That was a three hour pay per view with however many matches. They were all like seven minutes. Six minutes, four minutes. You didn't even think about it. Well, see that the, it, there was variety though, because at least on the NWA or WCW pay per views, the main events, the top matches would get more time, except if it was a gimmick match, didn't need it. But the preliminaries were much shorter and it balanced out. You gave more attention to the matches that you were more interested in seeing at the top of the card. And we didn't start with cage matches. It's interesting. You know, if you look at some of the matches that were actually short and you extended them, it wouldn't help everyone. If you took Piper Adonis and turned it into a 20-minute match, I don't know if it makes that a better <laughs> match. I don't think it does. If you took Coco versus Butch Reed and you turned that from a three-minute match to a 20-minute match, probably would have been a great match. I don't know if that crowd was the crowd for it at the Silver Dome, but now just every match goes and goes. And goes and goes. Well, speaking of going, let's go on. Uh, the U.S. title was on the line with our boy Austin Theory against Rey Mysterio, and the bell rang for this, the third match on the program, an hour and 15 minutes into the show. The bell rang to start the third match. How does this fucking happen on pay-per-view? We used to be asking people to pay for a, a kind of a televised house show, non-interrupted with, Gaga and backstage and commercials and advertisements and and now it's it's uh, Austin Theory is great as we've talked about Rey Mysterio is a pro and a true legend and they did the match where Rey fights from the bottom because that's his thing now and that's you know what suits him and I love both guys but this is this felt to me like a Raw or SmackDown match with longer with no breaks in the middle of the match, at least. We see it. it it's a WWE-style match that we see over and over, and Theory is just better than most people at it, and Ray is bulletproof with the fans and always exciting, so... But it's just, it is what it is. The Cinnamon Toast Crunch in pastels on the... Titan Tron and the railing make it look like a kid's show from Nickelodeon in 1988. And finally, Ray hit the 619. Theory went for his finish, and Ray rolled him up one, two, three. It's not like we're going there. Again, there's no Eddie Graham style roller coaster of emotions finishes involved in this shit anymore. It's kind of like, well, we'll do it for a while, and then we'll get him up, and then we'll go. I thought it was a really effective match in the sense that I got up uh, and looked for some Cinnamon Toast Crunch in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> that was all right. You kind of hit on the main thing. It just felt like another SmackDown match. It was hard to take this seriously. There were matches. There are matches that you look forward to seeing, matches that could surprise you. Sadly, just because of the way it's been played out, and it feels like I've either seen Theory versus Ray or Theory versus Escobar a lot lately, it just feels like something I would have seen on SmackDown. Well, here is the problem also. We're seeing so much because they're showing us so much. How different can it be when the each company sets up their TV, their lighting, their ring looks the same, and we're seeing a lot of the same talent? It, it, how How different can anything be at this point? Because there's so fucking much of it. The, the Steel City Street Fight with Owens and Zayn against Priest and Finn of the Judgment Day, was it was a departure of what they've been doing on this card, but then it's stuff that Owens and Zayn, they love this shit. They wanted to do this shit in Ring of Honor. They did it for very little money in Ring of Honor, and now they're making a lot more money, but this is still all they want to do. They love the... It's, I don't know where Priest's background is. I know Finn's been, you know, he was a pro for a long time before he got in this system. He's an old veteran. I assume he's not 
one of the crowd that just, oh, I wish we could have a gimmick match with weapons. But uh, the, they, the, as soon as they rang the bell, immediate four-way, they go to the floor. As soon as they get in the ring, immediately they got chairs and kendo sticks. And then they go back to the floor. And then Sammy dives. And then Owens and Zane pull out garbage cans and beat on both the heels over and over again. And then Owens reveals his Terry Funk shirt. And then they pina colada, pina colada, pinata, Finn. Do you like pina colada? <laughs> do you again getting caught in a garbage can in the rain? They piñata Finn with the garbage can over his fucking head. And it, I'm like, Jesus Christ. I'm, that's where I wrote, why don't both companies just pick a match and put it on a loop and play it? And it's cheaper. You don't have to pay all the boys. Because it's all the same shit that everybody does. Then Sammy and Owens pulled out a table and set it up and then walked away from it. It took over to the heels and then the heels took over on them. And I, they're like five minutes in the in the match, and nobody has actually taken a bump in the ring. And then they got in the ring with a garbage can and five chairs, but nothing was happening. And <clears throat> there's a lot of milking going on in these in the garbage matches with the furniture and the uh, whatever. If all you're gonna do is a weapons match, it's got to be get in it and get go fast and do shit and get out of it. Because if it goes long too, then it gets brutally boring and repetitious, and it's just it's inanity. And they do the chair shots over and over, and then they go back and they fight in the back of the arena, and then Dominic comes out blatantly to help three on two because it's no DQ. And then the baby faces disappear while Dominic and Finn and priest are just standing there talking to each other, apparently about what they can do now, because they're not going to wonder where the fucking baby faces have gone. When suddenly the baby faces reappear dressed in hockey uniforms with hockey sticks and Owens is his whole face is covered in fake blood. And they start beating these fucking guys up with the hockey sticks. And they beat them back to the entrance. And then they beat up Dominic. And then they fight him back to the ring. And the longer that Owens goes, the more the fake blood wipes off his face. Until finally, there's only the the slight stain of whatever the material is or the chemical is in fake blood that makes it stain your skin, not like real blood. So Owens was, I used to be of the idea that if anybody ever used fake blood in wrestling, they should be shot at sunrise without even being given a last cigarette, except if you're doing something from the throat, okay, I, we can get by with that. But then I'm starting to wonder, should I admire Owens's goddamn dedication to garbage wrestling that he's had since the Ring of Honor days, that he knows that if they're doing all this shit, somebody should be bleeding, but they're not allowed to actually have blood, so he used fake blood. Is that a weird kind of dedication to his craft? No, I think you could say one of the good qualities of Kevin Owens is that he's true to who he was years ago. <sighs> but anyway, so uh, Sammy and Kevin arrange the chairs in a shop class project in the ring and then Priest suplexes Sammy on top of him. So that'll teach him. They get back on the floor. All of Owens' blood is wiped off. They're back in the crowd. They're back to the back of the arena. I wrote, I can't take any more. I zipped ahead a bit. Uh, Kevin swantoned off the balcony and put Dominic through a table, but uh, Owens' legs hit the floor hard. He's, <laughs> I wrote, what a maroon, what an imbecile. He's going to cripple himself doing this shit. He's got to be 40 years old now, or close to, and he's not goddamn Hercules. 
and he over-rotated a little bit on that one, and Dominic was spared the brunt of the explosion, and he went right over on his legs and his big fat ass. And then here comes J.D. McFunco Pop, and he comes out, and he's going to do whatever the fuck, I don't know, and Rhea speared Owens through the railing, and Sammy hit his finish on Finn, and got a two count, and Dominic saved, who's not even in the match, saved with a briefcase shot over Sammy's head right next to the referee, because it's a street fight, and Finn covered him in one, two, three, and they are the new champions. So, a street fight match is traditionally a blow-off match where the babyface is going to win in the end because he can finally give the heel back all of his dastardly tactics, and you don't bury the referee because of that. But, when somebody not even involved in the match blatantly comes and hits one of the babyface champions over the head with a blunt instrument right in front of the referee, no DQ or not, and then they just pin him. That's not psychologically for the wrestling industry the right kind of fucking heat. I'm sorry. Your thoughts? I'm not going to add too much to that. I agree with you, and I'm sick of these kind of matches, so it's hard to see one and think of it as special from anything else, and then they got into their teleporting phase of the match where they all of a sudden had their hockey uniforms on. I'm happy Judgment Day is uh, has won. I guess that's the one good thing I could say. <sighs> Something different. I'm, I've been sick of uh, Zayn and Owens, as I said on the show, for a little while now. Well, I couldn't wait for that one to be over with. And after... Wait a minute, I've lost my other note here. There we go. Two hours in, we've had four matches, and now guess what we get? A live interview on pay-per-view, and not even a live interview with the Horseman or a live interview with fucking Terry Funk. We get a live interview with Grayson fucking Waller and his whole goofy set, and he brings out Cody because Cody's got a big announcement. Now, have you noticed that they are now, if if they're running a promotion where the fans are getting free ice cream, Cody's going to be the one to announce it or be responsible for it. His picture's on the card you turn in for the free ice cream. It's brilliant. This is out of the Eddie Graham playbook, but Cody is involved. Remember he got Sammy and like his dad. Kevin back together? Like his yeah. dad. Involved gets, in everything. But he got Sammy and Kevin back together. He was the peacemaker and the mediator. And he gets, you know, he overcomes this obstacle. And over here, he makes this special announcement and does something else for the fans they like. It's brilliant. However, I wrote watching this because what I did was since uh, my mother in law was still in town when this aired. We were having a nice family dinner instead of me watching this shit. So I watched it early in the morning on Sunday morning. And watching this in the morning ruins my whole day, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I write, Grayson Waller is being forced down our throats, and I continue to ask why, because he's not a star. And the way to make a star is not to give him a segment where he acts like a star. It's to make him a star first and then give him a segment because he's a star. And they beat around every bush they could find, including the potted plants in the ring to stretch this announcement out. But basically Cody saw a wrong that needed to be righted. And he introduced a new member of the raw roster officially right now. Jey Uso. And here comes Jay, and he's back on Raw. And Cody leaves, and Jay gets in the ring, and Waller starts to fucking speak to him and pretty much pisses him off, and he doesn't say a word. He just super kicks Waller and leaves him laying there colder than a banker's heart and walks out the end. Did I cover all the high points? All the high points, yes. I just want to say that I... Been a fan of Cody's stuff recently, but his interplay with Waller here was awful. This was not good. This was not a good thing at all. There was nothing here. 
There was no reason. Waller's annoying. He doesn't get heat. He gets annoyance. He doesn't get heat. And they're booing him because they don't want to see this shit or hear it. And there was nothing for Cody to even made the most conversation he could. But it's like, here, um, you know, do this 30-second promo. You got seven minutes. What? Okay. But you know what the biggest problem is, don't you, Brian? That we're still talking about payback? No, the biggest problem is Grayson Waller. That's the biggest problem. Because you're watching Grayson Waller, whether it's on your TV, whether it might be on your computer or your phone or your streaming device. And you know, with the technology these days, I'm afraid that that we don't know the truth. It may be that all those people that you're watching on whatever your device is, they know who you are and they know where you are. And they're taking your information down. So they're one of these days, Grayson Waller himself is going to come knocking on your front door, one to do his Grayson Waller show right in your living room. And you have to take preventative measures right now. So if you don't want Grayson Waller to know where you are, you got to get ExpressVPN. And Brian, you've heard about this, haven't you? We're, uh, well, we've talked a lot about ExpressVPN, yes. Well, no, I mean the, 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 these big media corporations, the broadcasters and the streamers and the fishers and all these people are running down the creek without a paddle. They're all taking your information down. They know who you are. When you watch SmackDown or you watch one of these pay-per-views on the cock, well, right there, Grayson Waller knows who you are. I don't think that's how that works in any way, but go ahead. uh, Well, it is because they're they're tracking you down. No, it isn't. It doesn't work like that. You don't want Grayson Waller knocking on your door, do you? Even if there's a chance. The listeners don't have to worry. There's no chance Grayson Waller will be knocking on your door. That's right, because you can get ExpressVPN and he won't know what door to knock on. He'll He'll be knocking on doors from now till kingdom come and he won't be able to find you because you're just not there because ExpressVPN has hidden you. They put you underground, but with an oxygen tank, you'll be able to breathe, folks, because ExpressVPN makes sure that all these evil corporations can't keep track of where you are. You know how Netflix is screwing everybody. Why, they've got all these programs blocked for different countries and different places and different regions. You might not be able to watch Dumbo Does It Donkey Style in every country on Earth. But if you get ExpressVPN... And that may be a good thing. Well, by cracky, Netflix isn't the one that ought to decide that. They've got thousands of shows. <laughs> yes, they do. Thousands of yes, programs. They do. That's not one of them. Well, see, well, one of these days they'll pay the rights fees and they'll get that too. But you want to be sure you're going to be able to watch it? you got to get ExpressVPN because you only get a fraction of the programs that Netflix has based on your location. So what you do is you control where you want Netflix or other streaming websites or Grayson Waller himself to think where you're located, where they, you are, that, that. Did I mess up that grammar? Wow, I don't know what that was. You control where you want them Them? to think that you're at, not where you actually are. (laughs) You could be somewhere else. No, you control where you actually are. Well, you control where you want to be, too. All you, you gotta can do, go where you want to go. Go do what you want to do with ExpressVPN. You open their app, and be careful now. Don't drop it. Just open it, and then you select, let's say Bolivia. I don't know. They got ninety-four. Where is I? I saw that number. Where is it? Is it ninety-four different countries that they have servers in? People working at restaurants all over the world, and and these servers... No, not those kind of servers. After they get off their shift at the restaurant, they sit down and they start uh, compiling lists of uh, all the people that want to be somewhere else, and then they send you there. ExpressVPN has dedicated servers, and they are not the human kind. Well, they're very dedicated, all right. I'll say that they're very earnest in their efforts. But you open the app for ExpressVPN, you select whatever country you want to be in, you tap one button... And then you refresh your page, because it's probably stinking at this point. And once that page is refreshed, boom! You're in a whole nother place, a whole nother state of mind. 
and nobody can find you so you can watch all of the unsavory and potentially pornographic programming that you would like to watch and nobody's going to be able to put the finger on you or any other of their appendages in any of your other orifices because you've outsmarted them and you have indeed returned the penetration of orifice back in their direction because you're getting what you want and you're putting one over on somebody. Once again, we and that's what everybody wants. That's not what everyone wants, but once again, we want to remind everyone that there are wonderful programs all around the world, maybe services around the world that you can't access because of where you are. Perfectly legal services. Not Dom Dombo. Dumbo does a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> Dombo does a donkey style, or anything else. I, I, I've I've lost. We, we are in the time what, machine. Ladies what what and point are you? What point are you making? Here. I don't know. What are you trying to say? I'm telling the people that, that they can go right now to expressvpn.com slash JCE and stop paying full price for these streaming services and only getting a minute little microscopic portion of their content. Get your money's worth. And if you go to expressvpn.com slash JCE, not only will you get your money's worth, but you're going to get an extra. Three months of ExpressVPN, absolutely free, complimentary, gratis. That means you pay nothing. ExpressVPN.com slash JCE, three months free. And, uh, you know, spend those three months in Honolulu. They'll send you there. No, Just they won't send you don't there. Forget the, don't forget the sunscreen because it's hot this time of year out there. They'll send you. You'll. That's where you'll be located as far as anybody else knows. That's right, but your feet will be firmly on the ground where you are now. There'll be no free trips to Honolulu or any other exotic locale. Wait a minute. Do, uh, do you mean you have to you have to stand the entire time that you're in a fictitious country? Your feet are going to be on the ground. You can't sit down, lay down, put your feet up in a hammock, relax. Are your feet on the ground while you sit in this chair? No, actually, they're bent up behind me. They're bent up behind you? Really, Lanny? What are you doing over there? No, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm just sitting in my yoga position. No, actually, they're on the ground now, but right now they're on a stack of copy paper. So how about that? See? <laughs> well, we're talking about ExpressVPN. Don't let Grayson Waller know where you are. ExpressVPN.com slash JCE. Even if you didn't get the three free months, it's worth it to not let Grayson Waller know where you are. That's right. And that was WWE Payback from Pittsburgh. No, we're, we're not done. That wasn't it? That wasn't it. No. Don't you remember the the, the girls match that you? I, th oh! I thought you were talking oh, about yeah. Stole Your Heart. Oh, yeah. I will say when I watched it live, I forgot how many matches there were also. And after the tag title match, I was so like, oh, okay, you know, short and sweet, nice pay-per-view. And then I kept going. And going. And going. Rhea Ripley versus Raquel Gonzalez Rodriguez de Molina Jr. Um, Raquel is taller. I think Rhea is more voluptuous. I think we can say that. That has nothing to do with anything here. Well, as far as, as we're, we're talking to how they match up, the tail of the tape, so to speak. <laughs> you need more tape for Rhea than you would for Raquel. Significantly more tape. Possibly Raquel might just get away with a couple of band-aids. Okay, okay, less. will you be nice? Come on. <laughs> I'm just saying. But they were everybody was looking forward to this matchup because, you know, size versus size. Okay, Rhea Ripley has finally met somebody that's as big or bigger than she is, and you know what's gonna happen here. And I, I was again, I was concerned because a lot of times the size versus size you know, the giant versus giant doesn't work out as as pleasantly to the eye as one's anticipation in their in their mind. This was not bad. Raquel has a lot of potential. She's got the size. She's got the strength. She she works very hard. She ain't as smooth as hopefully she will be in the future or she could be yet. But Rhea made this. She's got balance. She's got timing, the basics, the personality, the psychology. She understands healing, the little things. The uh, I mean, just she is natural in the ring. She's relaxed and does this 
fairly naturally, whereas I think Raquel seems like she's still wound up a little tight. She's still a little nervous or focused, trying. It's not second nature to her yet. Um, I think it, Rhea slowed down a bit having to do a lot of Raquel stuff, but at the same time, you know, when she took over and was getting the heat, I was like, how is she this good at this age? She's still young, inexperienced, etc. But she works holds, which most of the guys on either one of these programs don't. Any, when she gets a hold, she's working it. There's motion going on. There's effort. There's a, a stance involved in it. When Raquel made her comeback, she went from zero to hero in five seconds. From I was down to, okay, I'm doing all this now. And they went they went into a few false finishes. The problem here with poor Raquel is that the fans were not going crazy for her because even though Rhea's a heel, they don't want to see her lose. They just want to see her. So if she doesn't, she's so good, she doesn't have a lot of heat heat. She's got a lot of, She's a star heat. Um, it it got a little long then and a little sloppier. And then finally, Dominic came to the ring and Raquel power slammed Dominic. And then Rhea kicked her and hit the riptide one, two, three. It wasn't bad. I liked it. It was a little long. But again, you know... <sighs> Rhea Ripley's a prodigy. No two ways about it. I will watch almost anything she does. Almost anything. There are some limits. What'd you think? Really good match. Rhea Ripley's the best women's wrestler in the business. And like I said before, I could see her eventually being maybe the best ever because she's so good. That bump she where she lands on the top of her head. Oh, yeah. Is incredible. And I've seen her do it a few times now. Each time I wince. But clearly she, she does it and does it well. She's the best in the business. She's the very best women's wrestler in the business. Will she make it long enough to be the greatest of all time before oh, she goes go. to Hollywood? Hollywood. You always bring up I'm Hollywood. Just, I think I did it earlier in this program that we when we started it about three or four days ago. Corny Bloom. Anyway, well, the bloom will be off the rose, I'll tell you that. And the bloom is already off the rose of this pay-per-view. I don't know... Well, I know which is a bigger insult. Uh, WWE delivers a lackluster, substandard pay-per-view main event, so AEW has to top them by just bringing out the fucking full-fledged joke book. But the world title number three was on the line because Roman Reigns was off work, and poor Seth Franklin Rollins, who has been designated the carrier of the, the belt that is known as the working man's world title because the fucking poor putz that holds it has to defend it constantly while the other guy gets to pick his spots in main events of all the great pay-per-views. And Seth Franklin Rollins had the pleasure and privilege here of going up against one of the finest tomato cans in the history of wrestling to the point where he was even dressed in a full red bodysuit. He must have heard I called him a tomato can. Did he, Brian? What do you think? Shaky Nakamura. No, he, he's worn that before. I think he got it made just for this occasion. No. A big, bright, red, delicious tomato can. Um, do you think Nakamura's entrance scares children with the convulsions and the twitching and the weird epileptic movements? Should, has anyone ever called an ambulance when they've seen him approaching the ring in that fashion? I was about to ask you the exact same thing about Seth Rollins' entrance. Well, I, I think the children are more or less laughing at him. Because I don't, I don't think they're scared of him. I think Shaky actually would cause... Like when Linda Blair turned her head all the way backwards. He's doing some, some weird contortions there. How was this a pay-per-view main event? It wasn't for me. I was, you know, look, despite everything he did in his career and how over he was, by 1987, I really didn't want to watch any more Jimmy Valiant matches. When you get to that stuff in the NWA, maybe you got some good promos still, but I don't need to see any more of those matches, and I kind of feel the same way about Rollins. I know he's really good in the ring. It's not a fair comparison. It's about just being sick of, I don't know, I can't... I thought you were going to say that about Nakamura. No, I'm not... 
really into him right now either. But to me, the bigger problem is Rollins. I can't get behind this guy. He's the world champion. He comes out there acting like he's on PCP and I'm supposed to give a shit. I can't. I think he's actually just on the P. He left off the CP. I mean, I would take Seth Franklin Rollins against some. I'd like to see Seth and Brock. That would be interesting. Have we ever even seen that? See, for the world title, that might make this legitimate, but they can't take Nakamura, who's been either off, injured, or an afterthought for who knows how long on that program. And in a couple of weeks, they build up this, you know, confrontation between the two of them and expect it to be a world championship match. This is the company that gave us Austin and Rock and Michaels and Hart and Rollins and Nakamura. And I still see a middle-aged man in a red pleather scuba suit here. He worked harder than ever here and longer than he's had an opportunity to in a while, but everybody knows he had no chance. He wasn't going to win. It's not a major rivalry. And it still went forever. And then Rollins hit the pedigree, and Shaky hit a kick, and Rollins hit a stomp out of nowhere. One, two, three, 25 fucking minutes. I don't think anybody would have been insulted if Seth put him away in 15. But uh, did we ever establish how old a motherfucker he is? Yeah, you keep acting like he's so much older than... He looks to me to be older than the ancient Mariner. He looks like his social security number is one. He looks like when he was in school, they didn't have history. That's ridiculous. He looks like his mother charged the light brigade. He's from Japan. What does that have to do with his age? He's 43 years old. He's lived a hard life. He's the same age as me. He's lived a hard life, as Mama Cornette used to say. Now, I'll tell you what. I haven't seen you in 10 years, but last time I saw you, you looked 10 years younger than Shaky Nakamura does now. Easily. Well, I'm a very good-looking man. So, that was that. Just can't help it. He well, can't that, help it or you can't help it? I can't it. help it, and I can't help that that was payback. Like you said, I guess the question you asked in the beginning was, right, are the fans going to ask for to be paid back after this? Maybe so. You know, when people buy tickets to shows that are announced as premium live events or pay-per-views or whatever, they're got, they got to be thinking, oh, I'm going to see Roman Reigns versus whoever, the, and they got Seth versus Shaky. They seem to handle it well. They've still cheered and had a good time, but there has to be some element of letdown. Well, speaking of element of letdown, uh, I think we're done with the WWE portion of the day. We certainly are, and I'll tell you, you know what the problem was with the whole pay-per-view, why nobody was over? You know why, don't you? It's, It's plain as the nose on your face. I did not know why, no. Nobody was over because nobody came out of a box. That's the tried and true method, Brian. That's the way to get people over. Just have them burst out of a box. Because whether you're a person, a place, or a thing, if you burst out of a box in front of a crowded room, you're going to get over. That's a way to make a star. And if you want stuff bursting out of boxes in your house on a monthly basis, all you've got to do is just sign up for your brand new, brand spanking new, and your very own box of awesome. And then, uh, Brian, you know all the things that come out of that box of awesome. Sometimes they pop out. Sometimes they burst out. Well, they actually sent a Dalmatian puppy last month. And that thing just popped right out of that box. Their boxes are secure. Nothing pops out. Nothing breaks out. Everything is there for you to open up and discover. And there are no live animals or creatures that are shipped by box of awesome and bespoke post. Well, then who in the heck sent me that Dalmatian puppy? I, I, Tony I thought Kong. That was, I thought that was my box of awesome. I had to send him back because uh, Harley didn't get along with him, but oh. I boxed him up in the same box and I stuck a hole in it just oh. to make sure he could breathe. Well, what was the return address? Where would you send it? I, someplace in the Philippines. But that, anyway. That's not our good friends at Bespoke Post and the wonderful product that is known as Box of Awesome. You know what? That should have been my clue because Box of Awesome comes from right here in this United States of America that we live in. But I'm sure they ship around the world, folks. But regardless of where you live, or perhaps you can 
team up with the ExpressVPN people and con the people at Box of Awesome. But no, no bad idea. I guess those two things would conflict with each other. If you told somebody that you ordered something from that you were somewhere else than where you are, then you really couldn't get what you wanted. Plus, they are all our friends. But every box of awesome is filled with carefully chosen gear from the best small browns, brands or browns, the best small brands around the world is what they are. From camping gear essentials to autumn cocktail upgrades, cozy threads even, hey, that's a hip way to describe clothing. Box of Awesome has collections for every part of your life. And 90% of everything that comes in your Box of Awesome each month is from a small up-and-coming brand, a small business, mom and pop, the heartbeat of America, the good solid citizens of the Midwest that plant the seeds in the soil and then water them and watch the sun come down and they burst into buds and they shoot up toward the sky to feed the country and the world. These kind of salt of earth people is what's putting this stuff in your box and it's coming to you and you ought to be grateful for it. You know, good son of a bitches, you take it for granted because each box is valued at around $70, but you only pay a fraction of that price. No, you won't pay full price. Not you, not people like you. You want to take advantage of these small up and coming businesses. Well, it's free to sign up and you can skip a month or cancel any time so you can punish these people by ripping them off and not paying them fair price. No, what because is, the, what, the box of awesome is giving you such a great deal that I'm surprised these people can stay in business. The, as cheap as this stuff is being sold to the customers, it's quality merchandise, but you're paying almost nothing, folks. When you go to boxofawesome.com, all you do is you take the quiz, and your answers help them pick the right box of awesome for you and then stuff you're interested in, things of that genre are delivered to you constantly every month. And and again, you're paying us a fraction of the price it's worth. How are these, these poor mom and pop businesses going to survive? You ought to pay twice as much for the box of awesome you get every month as you're doing. I can't believe you're taking advantage of these people like this. Box of Awesome is helping the small mom and pop businesses, not taking advantage of them. Well, so I don't they know need to why you would prices. go with this narrative of all the things you could what? go with. They're going. They, they, they ought to raise their their prices. Box of Awesome can't be making any money. They're selling stuff like this. They're practically giving it away. This is high quality merchandise. Everybody should be signing up for this. They want this. They need it. They gotta have it. And you ain't going to pay much for it. And if you go to boxofawesome.com, code JCE right now, you're going to get 20% off your first monthly box. Just use the code JCE at checkout. And if you're getting 20% off, and it's already a fraction of the price of the value of the merchandise, they're practically giving this stuff away. So right now, before all these people go out of business and starve because they can't pay their bills, Buy everything Box of Awesome has at boxofawesome.com and enter the code JCE. I don't expect them to last much longer, so just buy everything they offer. It might You might as well get it before everybody else does. Boxofawesome.com. That's right. Wonderful products, wonderful companies. Check this out today. Box of Awesome. Ignore everything that Jim just said other than that. Well, well wait a minute. You want them to ignore me on my own show? When it comes to the things you just said, other than the positive things, yes. So just accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and don't mess around with Mr. In-Between. Box of Awesome.